Sound of Money with Santosh Seru. Hello and welcome to another episode of my podcast, The Sound of Money with Santosh Sirur. This episode is truly amazing and a special exclusive one. On this podcast, I have Dr. Todd A. Finkel, who is a very special guest joining me from Washington. Dr. Finkel, who grew up in Omaha and went to high school with Peter Buffett, Warren's son, has made six visits to see Buffett with students on this podcast, Todd talks to me in detail about Warren Buffett, his life, his experiences, his learnings, his mistakes, and above all, the positive impact that Warren had on his life. His book titled Warren Buffett, Investor and Entrepreneur, published by Columbia Business School Publishing, this book has been translated into 11 languages and will be an audiobook soon. The book is one of the most up-to-date biographies of Warren Buffett, that traces his entrepreneurial route from selling gum door to door during childhood to creating his partnership, to forming Berkshire Hathaway and building it into a global conglomerate through the imaginative deployment of financial instruments and creative deal making. It also evaluates Buffett's investment methodology and mistakes, his behavioral biases, Charlie Munger, and a history of Berkshire Hathaway. Dr. Finkel is a pioneer and an innovator in the field of entrepreneurship education, founding two nationally ranked programs. He also has over 39 years of investment experience and is currently the Piggott Professor of Entrepreneurship at Gonzaga University. And uh, well, joining me from Spokane, Washington is Dr. Todd Finkel, a very special guest uh, for our podcast uh, on the sound of money. And here he is. Uh, hi, Todd. And how are you? Uh, hi, Santosh. Thanks uh, for the invitation. It's going to be a fun night of talking about Warren Buffett. Absolutely. And, you know, you have been so close to him and his family. I'm sure there are those nuggets which, you know, probably most of us in here in India and even otherwise don't know. And I'm sure you would love to share that with us. But before we talk about uh, about Warren Buffett and his family, tell us about the book itself. How long did it take you? And you know how easy or how challenging was it even to get in touch with Warren Buffett? Um, great question. Uh, I, I when I started uh, working with Warren, why well, I, I grew up in Omaha, and uh, I went to high school with his son. So that was my initial uh, initiation with the Buffett family. That was in 1976. That's how old I am. And uh, so I uh, um, didn't really think about publishing a book until about six years ago, even though I had been involved with Warren probably since 2007. Uh, and in 2007, my cousin who lives in Omaha, uh, Steve Nog, uh, you know, I'm a professor at Gonzaga. So he said, Todd, you need to come to Omaha and see Warren Buffett because he's inviting students uh, to, to visit him and hang out with him for a day. Uh, so I was right on that right away. And, uh, you know, you don't want to write anything really long. Yeah. to Warren Buffett because he's probably got a million people mm -hmm. contacting him every day with mail from all over the world. So I just wrote a, a really kind of a short one page uh, note to him and saying that I went to high school with his son uh, and uh, that, uh, you know, I'm a professor and I started a nonprofit while I was a professor to help people. Uh, and, uh, I thought that would, would be good enough to get me in to go visit him. And, you know, he invites like 27 students in addition to the professor. And I got rejected right away. Okay. And the secretary said that the line uh, to go see him is years long. Don't even waste your time. Wow. So I was very depressed. And I can't <laughs> I imagine. Really... <laughs> I really wanted to go visit Warren Buffett, you know, and 
Uh, so this was, you know, right around the time of the Great Recession uh, and everything in the world just kind of stopped mm. during the Great Recession. So I had time. I still wanted to learn as much as I could about Warren because yep. he's he's such a significant man and so smart. And uh, I just wanted to learn as much as I could and absorb mm. Hmm. what I could learn about Warren through secondary uh, research and primary research. And so I started writing a case okay. study on him, you know, in hmm. academia, we get evaluated on our research. So over about a two year period, I wrote this case study. And by the time I ended up getting it published, um, I decided I had this epiphany and I thought, well, why don't I send the case study to Warren Buffett? Mm -hmm. uh, because I'm an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. even though I'm in academia, I'm an entrepreneur. You can be an entrepreneur anywhere, you yeah. know, in a big company or a small company or startup or nonprofit. So I'm thinking outside of the box. Okay. Maybe Warren Buffett will invite us if he sees all this work that I did yeah. on him. Yeah. And I wrote this case study about him and uh, and um, to make a long story short, I sent it off to him. And uh, within 10 days, I got this letter back in my mailbox at work uh, with just a, an address, uh, not okay. anybody's name on the envelope. And I opened it up, not knowing any better. Yeah. Uh, and it was from Warren Buffett. And it it said, thank you for writing such a nice case study about me. Uh, I'm inviting you to Omaha this November. Awesome. And that was in, in 2009. Mm -hmm. and that was the same weekend that uh, uh, they he purchased Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. Oh, so okay. here, here we are up in Omaha, <laughs> a little fast forward there. Uh, oh, by the way, I was dancing after I got that letter. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you, how was the reaction, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I was I was just so happy. And the uh, the 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 next problem, mm -hmm. I mean, it was great and everything, but now you've got to figure out a way everybody all the students want to go visit warren buffett yeah so you got to pick who right to i got who. like i got like two thousand students <laughs> in the college of business everybody wants to go visit warren buffett yeah so that that into itself was just uh it, it was like teaching an extra class <laughs> and, but the thing is is that i narrowed it down and i, I got the right kids mm -hmm. to go mm -hmm. because I mean, some of them still have their picture with Warren Buffett up because mm -hmm. he took a picture with each one of us Wow! up on their LinkedIn profile. So that's how big of an impact Can that imagine. he had yeah. on them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyway, so we go to Omaha. We go to a couple of uh, subsidiaries with him. Uh, actually, it was the Nebraska Furniture Mart, which was the largest private furniture store in the country at the time. He eventually bought them out. Yep. And there's a story behind that. We can yeah. talk about that later if you want. Yep. Um, we also went to uh, Borsheim's, which was the largest jewelry, private jewelry store in the country. And he bought them out <laughs> you know, later on. And uh, of course, Warren's got so much money. By the way, he has 150 billion in cash right now in T bills. Awesome. Probably earning about five and a half percent. Not wow. bad, eh? Yep. And he's and what I believe it started off with just about hundred dollars years back, right? Yeah. 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 His yeah. Uh, his partnership that he started in 1956, he only put in a hundred dollars, and and now it's Berkshire Hathaway today yeah, and huge and what is what is berkshire hathaway the market cap is what 800 billion yep awesome pretty amazing yeah you yep. know a lot of people have told me that uh my book should be the script for a movie on warren buffett oh you never know when 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 all the ott platforms reaches out to you yeah hey you know you never know you're right yeah you yeah. never know true, true. so uh 
anyway, back to our trip to Omaha. We we went to these subsidiaries. Then we had a two and a half hour Q and A with Warren. Uh, and the, the schools that were there had an opportunity to ask him questions about anything. It could be anything. And uh, we had ours all planned out ahead of time. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then we went out to lunch with him uh, at Piccolo Pete's, which was a uh, small family restaurant in Omaha. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, uh, kind of a little funny story there after uh, we I was sitting right across from him at lunch with my wife uh -huh. and I asked him, I'll ask him one question because I knew so much about Warren from yeah. writing the case study. Yeah. I just said, uh, how do you value, how do you value a company? Mm -hmm. And his answer was uh, the discounted cash flow. Okay. Uh, you and I was hoping to get more than that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I knew that that wasn't the only <laughs> thing, you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> And so I ask him again, I go, how do you value a company for it? And, and he, uh, he said the same thing. Okay. But so I moved on to something else, uh -huh. but he loves kids and he okay. loves to teach. Uh, and that's why he had all these universities come and he yeah. did this for years. He quit doing it in 2017. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but he just loves it. And as, as a matter of fact, I think when he was when he came back from working on Wall Street, mm -hmm. he actually taught a class oh, uh, at the okay. University of Nebraska at Omaha on uh, intro to investing. So that's mm -hmm. how much he loves to teach and to help people. And he has said that he if he wasn't doing what he was doing today, that he would be a teacher. Oh wow, that that that's a very noble profession, right? And you are one of them, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So uh yeah. yeah. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. You 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 you've been knowing uh, Warren and his family since probably the 1970s, right? What was his childhood like? Because when we look at Warren Buffet for us, he's a billionaire, he's up there, right? Was it always what was the family, you know, the background that he comes from? So, uh, myself, um, you know, I did research uh, and I went to go visit him with uh, three groups of students for nine years and another three uh, to the shareholder meeting. So I did all this stuff. Yeah. And I finally decided to write the book on him. Um, and then, you know, after I did a rough draft of the book, I did it all the complete opposite way that you're supposed to. Yep. So I wrote the book. What okay. you're supposed to do is you're supposed to, to do a book proposal and you send it out and you get an yep. agent, all this other stuff. Yeah, I wrote the book. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I didn't yeah. wait for any, any wow. of those people. And so after I wrote the rough draft, I sent it to Warren. Okay. Now, this is getting back at your question. Yep. So I sent it to Warren because I, I wanted to know what he thought mm -hmm. and I wanted to get feedback on the book and he he knew me already so that was an advantage mm. uh, for you know hanging out with him yeah um, several times and and we're friends mm. so i consider warren a friend of mine i sent him a, a nice birthday card and uh thanked him for for uh influencing being a positive impact on my life and mm. i think it, everybody out there should be doing that to to the people that uh, that you care about yeah yeah but um he said to me that something that was really uh, kind of cool mm -hmm. he said that it's nice to have somebody writing a book about me mm -hmm. that knew us from the time when nobody knew us mm -hmm. and you know they weren't wealthy mm -hmm. okay because in 1976, Berkshire Hathaway, I mean, he owned Berkshire Hathaway, but the stock price was $69. Mm -hmm. And okay. you know what the stock price is today? How much is it? Well, it's it's gone down a little bit because there's yeah. been a correction in the market. But the last time I saw it was over 500000 wow. It's probably down. I, I don't know. So when I knew Pete, yeah. Uh, Warren's son and we used to eat lunch in the cafeteria all the time and he was a really good guy and he had a baseball cap and ripped jeans and 
Uh, and but he hung around with the smartest kids mm -hmm. in school. Uh, okay. th that was something that his father taught him very well. Hang mm -hmm. around with people that are better than you. Okay. Mm -hmm. He really emphasizes that to all of us. Okay. So hang you know, you want to flow in the direction of people that are better than you. Oh, that's a very, very good learning. Yeah. And uh, so Pete obviously was following in that because there were some just brilliant people. At, it, it was called Omaha Central High School. Uh huh. And it's not that far away from Warren's office on Farnham. It's probably, a, you know, I don't know, about 18 blocks away mm -hmm. from his office. It's downtown. It's right by Creighton University. Uh, and it's by where he has his annual shareholder meeting every year. And 40,000 people come from all over the world for his yeah. annual shareholder meeting. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so he, he said that to me, you know, when I sent in the, the rough draft of the book. And uh, uh, I was all excited because he gave me the thumbs up. And he said, okay, Todd, you know, go for it, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How long did uh, it take you to write this book overall? Well, it, it's hard to say exactly, but, you know, the, again, the first nine years were my interactions with Buffett. Okay. And then I wrote five articles during those nine years, you know, a couple of case studies and, yeah. and some articles. So I was already doing research on, on Buffett mm. uh, back then. Mm. And then it, there was a time where I just thought to myself, Hey, you know, I have enough material. You know, we have two and a half hour Q and A's with him every time we yeah. go. You know, that's that's all fresh material. That's Absolutely. all uh, primary research, and it's in the book. Uh, I put it in the book, and uh, and it's great stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just great stuff. And I interviewed Susie Buffett in the book, mm -hmm. uh, and that was great. And I interviewed another. Uh, subsidiary Brooks Sports, which is in Seattle, Washington, mm -hmm. and he's at the shareholder meeting every year too. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so I I finally said, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to do it. And then my friends, who are all in finance, okay. uh, and I'm an entrepreneurship professor, <laughs> but I love investments. I've been doing both my whole life. Yeah, uh, they all they all said they were all kind of kidding me. And they all said, hey, you know, there's already all these books that have been written on Warren Buffett. What, yeah. what do you what do? Extra ad, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, and I go, hey, man, you know, basically what I was thinking, I wasn't, mm -hmm. I wasn't listening to them. Mm. I, because I know better being an entrepreneur, you know, yeah. if everybody tells you not to do something, then, you know. Yeah, yeah. Maybe there's then there's something, something there. in that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and so I ignored him and okay. I went for it. Fantastic. Okay. And it's been successful so far. I'm, uh, I'm shooting towards a bestseller my first awesome. year. I'm not there yet, but yeah. I have a shot at it. Okay. 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 Um, so, yeah, uh, the book was, it, it probably took me about five years to write full time. And I was up till three, four o'clock in the morning uh, mm -hmm. every night doing that. And also it it's difficult because, because I, I've never done something this significant before. I've never mm -hmm. you know, tried to get in with the top publishers yeah. uh, in the country. And I went, I did, I went through the whole process. Mm -hmm. I, I interviewed with agents yeah, and I realized that agents probably weren't going to do me any good, so I became my own agent, and I did the book proposal and I did the uh, query letters mm -hmm. all by myself. Awesome. And, and the entrepreneurship friend, in you came alive, right? I had a friend, uh, Charles Fishkin, mm -hmm. uh, that that I knew since I was nine years old, uh, and he had already published two books on awesome. risk management. Mm -hmm. So he was kind of helping me out with that. And I had mm -hmm. another uh, friend, uh, uh, Matt Koffler, mm -hmm. who was a CFA. Mm -hmm. And he helped me out with the, the valuation aspect. And for your young uh, listeners out there, you know, it, it's so important to have a team to help you. Yeah. Uh, 
yeah. to, to accomplish your goals. And, mm. and uh, you know, I, I run an entrepreneurship program and I have 70 people on my board mm-hmm. in the entrepreneurship program because I, I just, I can't keep up with all the changes in the environment. So, yeah. you know, if one of my kids needs some help in technology and you know, mm. stuff like that, I'll have somebody on my board yeah, talk yeah. to them about yeah. it. Collaboration works, the same right? thing with yeah. writing a book, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, so I go to my friends and they they uh, they help me and and they're there. They don't expect anything in return. Hmm. Agree. So it's collaboration that really works, you know, come together and work together. Very important. Uh, learning. Every, you know, a lot of things just have to line up. You have yeah. to get Warren to sign off on it for first. Yeah. Otherwise, nothing would go from there. Yeah. Uh, and then you got to find somebody that wants to publish it. And I yeah. really wanted a quality publisher. Yeah. And I found one in Columbia. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the top publishers in New York City, of course, Columbia is in New York City too, but, you know, the, like Scribner and those others, uh, yeah. Little Brown, that they're really looking for kind of, uh, you know, h- huge name people, gossip, mm. yeah, yeah, know, Barack Obama's biography, stuff like that. You yeah, know, I'm not going to get that because I'm doing Warren Buffett, and it's already been done. Yeah, you yeah, know? they look at the, it in the, that perspective. Yeah, the mm. biography on Warren Buffett hasn't been done since 2008, so mm. I ha- I did have an advantage with that. Yeah, true. true. But it was it was tough to to get a quality publisher. Columbia picked me up right away when I went to the presses. Uh-huh. Uh, the presses, I, I went to Stanford and I went to Chicago uh, and Columbia and Columbia picked me up right away. Oh, okay. Okay. You you know uh, uh, the Buffets since your childhood. Uh, how, how was the childhood of Warren Buffet? What about his parents? What were they into, you know? Yeah, that's a gr- great question. Uh, you know, what's surprising about Warren is, you know, everybody thinks he's this uh, kind of rich, spoiled uh, guy, and he's always had a lot of money, and nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, mm. he, he was born in August 30th, 1930, and uh, that was right in the middle of the Great Depression. Yeah. His father had lost his job. His mm. father lost all their money. Mm. And his mother, uh, who uh, her side of the family had some uh, mental health issues, mm-hmm. her mental health issues started to pop up in her. Uh-huh. Uh, and the kids were saying that um they could tell by the tone of her voice when she woke up in the morning, wow. whether it was going to be a good day or a bad day. Mm. And she would often abuse the kids mm-hmm. and tell Warren he was worthless. Mm. But on the other hand, Warren loved his father. Mm-hmm. He had problems with his mother throughout his life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and But he just, he worshipped his father. Okay, okay. In his office, he's got two things on the wall a uh, he doesn't have any degrees but he does have the certificate he got from uh dale carnegie he took a dale carnegie course wow. when he came back from wall street and uh uh and the other is a picture of his father oh interesting interesting yeah uh, yeah yeah his father really kind of set the tone for him as far as values are concerned Mm-hmm. and formulated how he thinks and how he treats people and he's his father had this a value system that was you know uh internal versus versus external external being like you know a big house or a nice car and lots of money and stuff like that his father didn't really care as much about that he was more about internal and how you treat people yeah, uh, and being a good person, and and that's what Warren picked up with from him. Okay, okay. You you knew his. Uh, I guess, I believe uh, Pete was your friend, right? Uh, Pete. Uh, yeah, uh, I I yeah. Uh, I hung around with a whole gang of guys in, in high school uh, that were older than I was, that a couple of years older than me, and uh, 
And Pete, when I got to high school, Pete was uh, also hung around with them. Uh, and I met him at lunch. And so we would hang out uh, and I'd talk to him at lunch. And he was just, you know, just he was such a, a very nice man. And he was into arts and photography and and music. And he actually became a famous musician on I, I think he might have won a Grammy, but I'm not wow. sure mm -hmm. about that. And he wrote a famous book mm -hmm. as well. Um I saw him at one of the shareholder meetings and went up and talked to him and um, just a, a really nice guy. And, you know, again, he hung around with all these really bright people. You know, one of the guys that we hung around with, uh, I won't mention his name, but he, he went to MIT mm -hmm. and then he went to Stanford for grad school. And then he became a CEO of two uh, technology companies, public companies. Oh. Uh, in Silicon Valley. This guy, I'm telling you, this guy was in a different world. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, a CEO of two different uh, tech companies in Silicon Valley. And I actually went to go visit him uh -huh. when I was younger. And uh -huh. he took me in. One was called Monolithic Memories. And they eventually, I think, got bought out by AMD. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, Tell me about, uh, yeah. Carry on. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, and Pete eventually went to Stanford after he uh, graduated from, from high school. He dropped out of there after he inherited $90,000 from his uh, grandfather's farm, and he just went into music full-time. Awesome, awesome. So, you know, uh, I think that drives uh, what, what Warren Buffett has been saying. Always, uh, uh, you know, ensure that, you know, you, you follow your passion, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, and I kind of differ a little bit with him on that. Is it? Uh, in okay. the sense that, uh, you know, he, I agree up to a point, you should do what you love. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that is that what happens, what happens if you don't have enough money to survive? True. Yeah. You got to be realistic, you, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I had that problem at one point. And so, most of us have, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I, I went after I went to grad school at Wisconsin, I had a lot of student loans hmm. and I wanted to work on the markets. Yeah. And uh, so I went interviewed at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, you know, in Chicago, hmm. of course. Hmm. And, uh, and they told me that they'd offer me a job, but it was only for $7 an hour, mm -hmm. $7 an hour being a runner. Wow. During the day, and th you know, this is in 1989. So mm -hmm. the the markets weren't run by technology back then. Yeah, it was the runners would go to the runners. pit, yeah, they'd pick up the order, and they'd bring it back to the checker, and the checker would send the order up to the trader. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I I kind of from my own experience, I. I disagree with Warren on that one you mm. should follow your passion as long as you can pay the bills yeah that's that, that's the that's the uh, absolute uh, secret which I agree we are completely agree. but I think he's changed I've been saying this a lot and I think he's changed his tune on that a little bit okay okay tell, tell me about the uh, mrs the famous uh, mrs b story mrs blanket story right and and what probably brought out of that is that uh, Warren Buffett believes that well education need not be a criteria experience counts experience matters maybe share your views on that and you've covered that in your book yeah th this is something that i talk to my students about usually more than once a semester i remember the the first time that we went to go visit warren he, I was sitting in the front row because I was all excited because it's Warren Buffett and we get to learn from him. And, um, and as he was saying this, he was looking right at me. <laughs> he goes, <laughs> he goes, uh, he goes, you know, the most successful business people that I've met in my life are people that don't necessarily have these high powered degrees. Mm. Uh, he actually mentioned a certain type of degree, but I won't you know, embarrass yeah. anybody. Yeah. Uh, and he goes, 
But it's the people that have the most business experience that think way outside of the box. Mm. Mm. So he's telling you that, you know, the combination of experience and being creative and innovative and entrepreneurial uh, are the most important things. And really, when he was talking about that, he was talking about Mrs. B. Mrs. B is from the Nebraska Furniture Mart, who the story on her is that she was born in Belarus and uh, grew up there. And I think she was managing uh, um, six people by the time she was 13 at a store wow. uh, over there. And uh, then I know her family wanted to move to the United States to get away from there. And, and so she went, I think it was through Russia somewhere in Russia and she bribed, she, she, bribed, she bribed the guard and said, listen, if you let me through, I'll bring back a bottle of brandy for you on my way back. Okay, you know? so she was really Of course, she never went back. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so she ended up uh, coming. I think she initially went to, to Iowa and then she uh, moved over to Omaha and she got married and she had kids and her business started and she didn't know English. Yeah. Oh, wow. And she didn't know how to write English. And she was she was in her early twenties, I think, when all this was going on, and uh, um, so she started as her company, even though she didn't know English, wow. a, a, in the basement of her uh, husband's business, mm -hmm. uh, and she was selling used uh, uh, clothes. Okay, and. Uh, then she had kids, and that's how she learned English was through her kids when her kids would go to school uh, and learn English, and and she would learn it through them. Okay, okay. Anyway, so she builds up this Nebraska Furniture Mart from her little uh, basement where she started, typical mm. you know, entrepreneur. Yeah. Uh, and she sold it to Warren Buffett on a handshake for, I think it was $58 million. Whoa. And it was it might have been a one or two page contract too. Wow. I can imagine I, the contracts in these years, right? There may be tons and tons of pages, but this was just a two page contract and millions of dollars. Yeah. I mean, I mean Warren, Warren, I'm sure knew her. He's known her for a long time. Yeah. He trust her. Uh you know, Warren, uh trust is huge mm. with Warren. And I'll tell you a little story. Yeah, related to trust and Warren. So Warren was friends with a, a, a Jewish uh, guy, and uh, this guy was in World War II, and uh, uh, he got turned into the Nazis mm -hmm. by a supposed friend, mm -hmm. and so he was in a concentration camp, and he lived, oh. and. Uh, so, you know, him and Warren became friends. And and so Warren, when he, and I noticed he did this with me when I first met him, he'll check you out and he sizes you up. And uh -huh. what's going through his head mm. is, is, will this guy save me from the Nazis? Mm. Would he save me? Can I trust this guy Yeah, yeah. to save me from the Nazis? Mm. He really uh, kind of has that. I guess he also has that flair or that kind of, you know, to get to know people to the core. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's kind of intimidating in a way, you know, because you know he's doing something. He's looking right at you. And uh, uh, he's got this unbelievable ability to, it, it's a combination of IQ and EQ, which mm. is very, very rare. Mm, interesting yeah the ability to read people hmm. which well, is uh an intangible hmm. very good very good uh uh you know it's a very good uh feature to have one yeah hmm. and i think you get that just through experience yeah through yeah. all the people that you've met in your life and yeah and 
the people that have burned you. Yeah. And yeah. the people that are more authentic. Yeah. What I also understand is whenever it comes to recruiting people, uh, he's always focused on 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 trust, right? Integrity is very integral, uh, uh, you know, so that there are no issues later in life or in his profession. So, so any experiences to share on that bit? But what I understand is it's always been uh, integrity, uh, and of course, uh, you know, getting to know the person. So, what are your what what was been your learnings from him on this? Ah. Uh... Well, I'll give you an example of something that went wrong, mm -hmm. which probably had a huge impact on him. And this was with, uh, I want to say, Solomon Brothers. Yeah, Solomon Brothers. There was an incident where a trader, and this happened like twice, the mm -hmm. same guy got caught doing illegal things. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, um uh the government caught him uh-huh and uh buffett had a big position in solomon brothers and uh, so he had to come because they were going to do some serious damage yeah to the company and maybe even break it up mm. and he had to go to washington to testify wow. and the reason why i bring this up is that he shows this mm. little clip this movie clip it's probably about three to four minutes long, but he shows it at every shareholder meeting hmm. that, you know, he won't tolerate, you know, people that don't have integrity hmm. uh, and, and, you know, he'll, he'll fire them hmm. right away. If he finds out that they're doing something hmm. to, to harm the reputation of the firm. Hmm. And so he it's said that it's, to, a, uh, it's a reemphasizing or reinforcing of the fact that, uh, it's absolutely zero tolerance uh, so far as integrity or trust is concerned, right? Yeah, I mean, he he just, and then he had another problem with another guy, you know, later on, and um, he was trading before, uh, I can't really talk too much about it because it's, there was a controversy on that guy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But yeah, he's had a couple of issues, but for the most part, you know, he follows these companies for a long time. Yeah. He gets to know the management team. He knows if they're ethical. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been burned a couple times in valuation yeah. of some of these firms. Yeah. But, you know, nobody's perfect. Yeah. And probably that's how he has learned, right? And I'm sure you have a chapter in your book about, you know, his mistakes or his learnings rather from those mistakes and how he still made it. So anything that you want to share about his mistakes or, you know, mistakes of omission, where they're probably, uh, and I believe there are 21 mistakes that he made and he still came out of it. And, you know, that's how life should be, right? Learn from your mistake. Yeah. Anything that you want to share on this point? The beauty of Warren Buffett is that at every shareholder meeting, he'll start it out with, you know, a mistake that he's made. If uh -huh. he's made a mistake, okay. he'll say it up front. Okay. You know, I screwed up on this and this is what I did. And, uh, which is cool, you know, because it, it just shows the humility that that mm. that Warren has. And I think that's another key to success for Warren is his ability to be humble. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. So. Uh, all these mistakes. So it took me a while to do that. There are two chapters in the book that I think are really important. One is this uh, mistake chapter. You know, you yeah. look at all the mistakes that he's made. Another yeah. that that's really important are the behavioral biases. Uh, mm -hmm. The behavioral biases was the last last chapter that I wrote in the book, and it took me a long time because it's a whole field, and it's a relatively new field. Oh uh, yeah, you know, and and behavioral biases. When I say that, it it's what Charlie calls temperament, Charlie Munger, who's the vice chairman of uh, Berkshire Hathaway, yep. uh, Buffett's right-hand man. Yeah. And Charlie always talks about the temperament. You know, it, you know, you could have a 180 IQ and still be a bad investor because of your temperament. Yeah. You don't so have the right. Bring in temperament. a lot of toxicity in, in the, in, in the work culture, et cetera. Right. Yeah. yeah and, and so I, I address, 
seven behavioral biases in the book mm -hmm. and I define them. I tell you which ones are really, really bad. Uh, I'll, talk, I'll talk a little bit about them. Uh, and then I'll give you an example yeah. of one. And then I'll talk about how uh, you can overcome them, things mm. that you can do to overcome them. And yeah. I also apply where I can on Buffett's mistakes, the behavioral bias that he did yeah. on, on his 21 mistakes that he made throughout mm. his career. I, I'm sure he's made more than 21 mistakes. Those are probably just the, you know, the biggest ones that yeah. Yeah. that I could find. And I'm even thinking about interviewing uh, Charlie Munger in person. That's yeah. something that I didn't do for the book. Uh, he's going to be 100 years old in January. Wow. Oh, he's yeah. Gonna, January of he's not going to be around very much longer. So a big party time, right? I, 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 I need to figure out a way to connect yeah to talk to him you know before he's he's gone and yeah but yeah. the mistakes you know the i'll start easily with the mistakes of omission warren always says that you know some of the biggest mistakes that he's made are mistakes of omission meaning the mistakes that he never invested in mm -hmm. and that goes back the first one that i can think of there is uh intel mm-hmm he had an opportunity to get in on the on the ground floor of Intel through uh, with Robert Noyce, who was one of the founders of Intel, through a friend of his that was on the board, who was mm -hmm. on the board of a college. And he told him about it, but Warren blew it off, <laughs> he, you know, and, and it might have had something to do with technology, you know, because Warren doesn't invest in technology or uh, back then he didn't invest back in then. technology. Yeah, 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 I can and, imagine. Uh, <laughs> so that that was huge. I mean, he he would have made God, who knows how much money he would have made on Intel, you know, yeah, and yeah. uh and then there was Google. Yeah. He had the opportunity to to invest in the IPO of Google and he blew mm. that off. Wow. Probably again. The uh, technology because, factor. Yeah. Yeah. It, he was still probably in that mindset, it was still the brick and mortar, and technology was just making the advances, you know, it was just in its very nascent stage, probably. Yeah. But later, I get, I believe the CIOs uh, have bought, have moved into and bought those uh, stakes, right, in some tech companies. Yeah. And the other one, uh, I, I gave a talk at the University of Iowa a couple of years ago, uh, and he's he was always talk, Warren was always talking about Amazon, Amazon, Amazon. He loves Jeff Bezos. Da 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 da. Yet he would never invest in Amazon. And this was back in 2017. And, and so somebody from the audience said, uh, what would you recommend that we invest in? Uh, and so I put up a slide. I yeah. said, well, this is this is Amazon. You know, Buffett loves Amazon, but he, he hasn't invested in Amazon. <laughs> you know, and, and I don't understand it. And uh, uh, so some, when he hired Ted and Todd of, eventually the they bought yeah. some amazon he didn't ah. buy it okay right okay that that's that's the key yeah <laughs> yeah so eventually he did i mean through the cios tell me uh something um you know we i want to go back to this point of uh, about the mrs b where you mentioned about uh, uh warren buffett giving a little bit of a importance of prioritization to a priority to experience rather than education Right. The reason why I bring this topic is in India, and I'm sure elsewhere in the world, there's always this debate whether I should do my MBA post my graduation or do get some work experience, get some exposure of the industry, you know, do the hands dirty and then do an MBA. So, so that's something which is very relevant in India even these days. So, so, so what's been your experience with your students you have interacted, uh, especially in your college? What, what's really preferred? Or is it like you know, either of these, but depending on your scores? And your intellect. I, I think it depends on the person, but what I tell my students is, is go work for a couple of years mm. and find out what you enjoy. And if you do want to come back, then you'll know what to study. Agree completely. Yeah. Yeah. Agree. And some of them don't even go back. You know, they become entrepreneurs and they don't need to come back. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That, that that's that's a very good very good uh, view uh, you have on this 
uh, because this is something very much topical and you know talked about in within the academic circles and within you know especially when students graduate it's quite a hot topic whether i should jump in the corporate ladder or do my mba first so yeah i'm going to yeah it's quite an interesting i'll tell you what warren would tell you yeah tell me <laughs> warren you know uh none of warren's kids went graduated none of them have a degree oh that's interesting <laughs> okay and he, after he graduated from high school, he didn't want to go to college. And uh, his dad forced him to go to Penn, the mm -hmm. Wharton School of Business. Mm -hmm. He went there for a year and he thought it was pretty worthless. And they were telling him all these theoretical things that had nothing to do. Because he was out there. He made $76,000 by the time he graduated from high school. Uh -huh. uh, what I believe is he, he actually sold bubblegum at the age of five. Uh, yeah, I think his first venture was uh, a lemonade stand on his neighbor's driveway when he was four. Oh. So, uh, and then he, he moved up in the world selling <laughs> Coke and gum door to door. Oh. And I think magazine subscriptions, he was doing that as well. And uh, he was picking up golf balls at, at the golf course and cleaning them up and and then reselling them. And he was selling uh uh, popcorn and peanuts at ball games. Uh, he was going to the racetrack and uh -huh. picking up tickets on the ground. I think there was swoop swooping or something. There's a name for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he was picking up winners that people thought they were losers, but they were winners. He was giving it to his aunt to cash in because he was too young. Mm. And he also had a, a sheet he was getting into the odds when he was like i don't know 10 11 12 years old he created his own like blue sheet uh -huh. odd sheet but they they called it something else and they were selling it for a quarter uh -huh. at the racetrack the racetrack was called exarbon which is nebraska backwards mm -hmm. okay nebraska okay backwards. And I used to go there as a kid as well. So I know exactly what he was up to when I was there. And I used to do the same thing. Okay. You know, the okay. swooping, you know, going, uh -huh. going, uh, um, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I was doing the same thing that he was doing. So, and what about uh, the pinball machine? I, I believe that was a big, big story, uh, you know, where he, he worked with a barber shop, if I'm not wrong. A dean. The, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Actually, that's my favorite. Uh, uh, Warren Buffett uh, entrepreneurial venture is that he he would buy used pinball machines for twenty five bucks, and then he would put them into barber shops and split the profits fifty fifty uh, with the uh, barber shop. And I think they had it up to about seven different uh, pinball machines, and he ended up selling that business to a war veteran for like $1,200. Oh. But, you know, the, the funny, there's a story, a good story behind that because, uh, you know, pinball back then was really big. You know, mm. Everybody loved pinball. And that was, oh God, what was that? That was 19, right around 1945 or so. Uh, and um, I taught a class, uh, to entrepreneurship students uh, at Gonzaga University. And, and one of the assignments for the class was, uh, I want you to create a product. So Warren Buffett, you know, when we give your product to Warren Buffett, he'll invite us to Omaha mm -hmm. because he, you know, you can't just, just walk send in. him a letter and get invited to go yeah. see Warren Buffett. No way. You know, that doesn't work. I already tried that. You know, mm -hmm. that doesn't you work. You got to earn, you got to earn that. You anymore. have to earn it, you know, and I, one thing that I've learned from all of the stuff that I've done with Warren Buffett, you know, there's a couple of things, but I've definitely learned one, you have to be creative and innovative mm -hmm. and think outside of the box. He loves that. Mm -hmm. and, and two, you have to be persistent. He loves people that are persistent. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um anyway so i i assigned this to the class it's you know i said it's 50 percent of your grade yeah and you can do anything you want to do hmm. everything as long as it's legal and it's ethical you can do anything you know write write a song 
make a movie, do a video, uh, write a paper, create a game, uh, anything. And, and these kids were great. These kids, I, the one that really did it for me was related to, to Warren Buffett's pinball venture. Uh -huh. so yeah. This, this team and, and one of them went on and got a PhD from Duke. Uh, and it was actually a, uh, a young lady who was getting a degree in, uh, uh, in religious studies. Okay. She came up with this idea. So uh -huh. she goes, let's create a Warren Buffett pinball machine. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So we'll send the pinball to machine yeah. to Warren Buffett. Yeah. We'll redesign the machine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we'll send it to him. And I could see Warren Buffett having that in his office and playing his Warren Buffett pinball Excellent. machine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought I thought it was genius. Yeah. Just genius. And yeah. and from a religious studies student of all people. Coming out is something, yeah. Yeah, imagine. Yeah. Again, it's uh you don't necessarily have to be a business student to be successful, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So did you actually guys send a machine to Warren and what so, was the reaction? Yeah, there's a little bit more to that story. Uh, heck, you know, I mean, if we would have had time, I would have put the money into it, to tell you the truth, just to see it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but we ended up uh, doing just a design because uh, yep. it was halfway through the semester when they did this. Uh, we only had a couple of weeks left. And, and so we did the design of a warm buff pinball machine and we sent in two other things. We sent in like a video of the values of Gonzaga. Uh -huh. They did a, a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. And another team did a, a game mm. like a, like a monopoly, but it was, you know, Warren Buffett with a, was a game piece and our president was a game piece. And, uh -huh. Okay. Uh, and I thought, you know, when I went to the post office to send all this stuff to Warren, I thought, you know, I'd probably have a 60-40 shot at going to visit him again. Yeah. Uh, and within five days, the the secretary contacted me by email, uh, congratulating me and inviting me uh, to Omaha again. Of so oh, that yeah. was that was fantastic. And it was party time again? <laughs> uh yeah, you know, but this time I was thinking, okay, you know, who am I going to take? Yeah. I could be a little bit more selective because I've been through this once yeah. already. And I took a couple of friends of mine that were professors with me and hmm. I, I was happy I was able to do that for them. And uh, one of our, our former dean here at Gonzaga was the longest tenured dean, hmm. uh, business dean in the history of the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, he was dean for like 38 years. Awesome. Hmm, wow. and, and the average tenure of a dean here is three years. Oh, wow. And where is 38 years? Amazing. 38. Yeah, it is amazing, isn't it? Yep. Just absolutely. incredible. Incredible. And he loves Warren Buffett. Wow. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that he he ended up going to to, to of course. Warren awesome. Buffett. Yeah, 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 indeed. That really made my trip, to tell yeah. you the truth, being able to do that for him. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, so much of hard work and effort and 38 years is no big joke, right? Yeah, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, yeah. now that you know uh, uh, Warren Buffett pretty much closely, what's, what's he like a person? You know, I mean, you, you, you have a guy who is $106 billion. What drives him? What motivates him? Is there anything that he, you know, uh, thinks about in terms of, you know, what's he looking up for in life? I I just think he loves what he does. Mm -hmm. He he gets a kick uh, out of getting up in the morning, and I think he reads like seven papers. He gets a kick out of being able to to pick up. Uh, an idea from just reading what everybody else is reading, yeah. But he can come up with an idea on how to make money from from reading that. Yeah, you know yeah. that's that's his kick. I believe you know, both I, Charlie and Warren read a lot, right? A lot. 
Yeah, yeah he, he doesn't read as much, you know, because he's 93 now. Yeah, but before, yeah, in the previous years, I'm sure he, he you know, uh, that, that must have been a very key point uh, that he was focusing on. Yeah, and, and Todd Weschler and Te uh, Ted Weschler and Todd Coombs, who are the co-CIOs, mm. uh, both read a lot as well. Mm. They say that they read about 500 pages a day. Wow. <laughs> That's another one of his keys to success is yeah. he's always learning. Mm, yeah, another very important learning, right? Uh, age uh, 92, age 100, but still learning. You're still a student. Amazing. Never, never quitting. Always learning all the time. Uh, and, yeah. and, you know, I'll give you another example of him always learning is this Japanese bank mm -hmm. thing. That just kind of came out of nowhere. Okay. We invested in them, wow. right? Yeah, yeah. And that was at this age, he travels to Japan. And, you know, not easy, right? Not easy. <laughs> no, you know, and uh, and Japan has done great this year, the stock yeah. market. Yeah, yeah. And and lucky, luck, lucky for me, I just got Japan, picked me, my uh, book up to tra oh. translate it into Japanese. Awesome. In fact, uh, your book, right? I have been reading your post on LinkedIn. It's coming in 15 different languages and in some uh, as an audio book. What, what, what was very surprising, and this is something very important for our, uh, for our audience in India. Uh, one of the languages selected is Marathi, which is, uh, which is the local state language of Maharashtra. And, and that's where I come from. Uh, very surprised why Marathi was selected. Did, did you have a choice? Have, here? No, I didn't have a choice. Uh-huh. Okay. Was there was there a better one? <laughs> of course, it could have been Hindi, which it. is the national language. Hindi, which is our national language. Yeah, but yeah, yes, I agree. Yeah, ideally, but uh, well, I was very surprised it's Marathi. But I'm sure there's somebody who is good at it, and you know they've got a good language translator. But yes, I think you could reach out to Colombia and also get the Hindi version because I can I can almost certainly see that post this interview going viral. There's going to be quite a demand for even a, a Hindi a version or an audio book at least to begin with for uh, you know for your book right and and and, and you know in in India uh, uh, Todd is a huge fan base of uh, Warren Buffett. We have so many people actually actually going to Omaha. Omaha uh, and it's like a carnival, right? When, I mean, people actually put posts on Facebook that, you know, we are on the airport, we're now in Omaha, <laughs> and, you know, and the yeah. post stories. So, so, so that's going to be very important. So tell me about Omaha, right? You have been to those conferences. How is the ambience? How is the environment around? I'm sure it's a lot of carnival time. Uh, all the shareholder meeting. If you haven't been to one, you have to go. Uh, but let me forewarn you, everybody else is thinking the same thing. So you need to make your reservations really okay. early. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, but you're right. You know, the, the Chinese and the Indian people love Warren Buffett, uh, and, and Warren loves them. Yeah. True. Can imagine. Yeah. Um, it's, it's part carnival. It's part circus it's part <laughs> cult yeah you know because you've got everybody's there for warren and for charlie yeah absolutely yeah absolutely yeah and, but yeah. you know the, the best part for me uh i went through different stages initially i was uh going with my brother and a mm -hmm. friend and we'd stay up all night mm. and then we'd go to the side entrance because everybody was waiting in the front entrance like a rock concert and they'd sleep all night <laughs> yeah. uh, to get into the, yeah. to the arena. And, and every time my brother would pick me up at like two 30 in the morning and we'd go down there, it's three o'clock in the morning and we're six people back. We would continuously be six wow. people back every year. <laughs> okay. Same people would be there every year. <laughs> and, okay. and, 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 and then the doors open and you got to sprint, right? To get the best. At, seat, at, right? at 7 a.m., the doors are open and they're playing uh, Pink Floyd's Money. Wow. That, oh, Money. That's awesome because that's also my signature tune of the podcast. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, wow, that's cool. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So uh, I ran track in high school. So once I got in, I was, I was gone. Nobody could touch me. 
So I was always like right behind the board of directors where Bill Gates is and all these, you know, the famous people that come to see Warren, Susan Lucci yep. Yep. Uh, and everything. And um, that was, that was a blast. And, uh, you know, I did that three times with students as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had a, a, a board of trustee that flew us on a private jet. Wow. To Omaha with six students and me. And that was, that was like being a rock star and they'd pick us up right there on their cars. And um, the, the uh, best part of, of the meeting is the people mm -hmm. and the people that you meet and they're, they're brilliant people. You know, these are people that have been following Warren Buffett for sometimes 20, 30 years uh, and they show up at the at the shareholder meeting. The shareholder meeting started in a cafeteria, and there was only like ten people mm -hmm. in the cafeteria. and And now you've got forty thousand people flying in from all over the world. Yep, huge. And there there are rooms that you can't get into if you're somebody like me or you. Uh, one year I was with a friend, and wow. we we walked into a room because they have what are called overflow rooms because mm -hmm. you can't get into the arena. Yeah. Uh, and I walked into one and they said, uh, you know, what are you doing in here? And she goes, this is for Chinese only. Oh. So it, they, they speak in Chinese mm -hmm. in there. So I, mm -hmm. I didn't know probably Mandarin, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mandarin. So, so I walked to the next room with my friend and the same thing happened. <laughs> <laughs> and then I walked to the next room and the same thing happened again. You know, so all these Chinese people are coming over here as well to listen to Warren Buffett mm. and, and Charlie Munger. Um, they're not stupid. Yeah, I'm sure there's, yeah, there's they, they a lot to learn from Warren. Yeah, yeah. And this past year, I had three presentations at the shareholder meeting and I did a book signing at the airport. Oh, uh, yeah. awesome. Mm -hmm. one, one of the, the uh, presentations was uh, at an all Chinese conference and they had an interpreter there and it was streamed to 500,000 people. Wow. That must be amazing. Wow. Yeah. 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 So that, you know, it's things like that that make yeah. writing a book on Warren Buffett really a lot of fun. Of course. Of course. So so this place, Omaha, right? And, 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 and I kind of read it somewhere that the very fact that uh, uh, you know Warren Buffett believes in local businesses, you know, supporting local businesses, which has been a very important uh, uh, factor for him all his life. The reason I bring this up is because in India, our Prime Minister, there's been a lot of focus from our Prime Minister for you know focusing on local businesses, as they say, you know, uh, local is vocal. Focus and buy their products. You know, support the local industry, and and it probably goes with the same kind of thought process which Warren Buffett has. Is there anything that you want to share? Because I believe when, when this carnival is there, Omaha, Omaha is now on the world map. And there's so much of local businesses that have thrived over the years uh, just because of this one person, one great personality like Warren Buffet, right? Yeah, his favorite places to eat in Omaha, one, one of it, his favorite place to eat dinner is a place called Garats, G O R A T S. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. uh, and, you know, it's a family owned business mm -hmm. and Piccolo Pete's where he took us for lunch mm. was a, a family owned business since mm. he, he took us there. It, it has closed down. I don't know why, mm -hmm. but, but you're right. You know, a family owned business is it, it's getting tougher and tougher yeah. to own a so family. Yeah, business. yeah, agree. Yeah. Yeah. But they are very, so important for the entire ecosystem to survive and thrive. Right. Yeah. Tell us about the yeah. Amex story, uh, because that's where, you know, he came in at the right time and invested and, and its rest is history. Uh, but I believe, uh, uh, how, how did he sense that Amex investment? Maybe you could share your views. So uh, uh, he first invested in American Express during his partnership years. Mm -hmm. His uh, partnership years was... Uh, just a, a little background before I get into Amex. Yeah. He came back. He worked on Wall Street under Benjamin Graham, one of his, you know, uh, biggest influencers on on value investing. 
and he became a millionaire, I think $1.6 million. Uh, and he was just going to go back to Omaha and take some college classes okay. and read and, and enjoy life because he, according to Warren, he said, I don't have to work anymore. I can just live off my interest and my dividends and da 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 da. You know, because yeah. this is like 1950, 55. Yeah. And uh that's a lot of money in 1955. And yeah. Um, um so his family didn't let him do it. His family mm. came over and they bugged him and they said, You're not retiring, Warren, you're gonna manage our money. <laughs> and they were telling him that uh, th that uh, uh, he's going to manage their money. And uh, so he agreed to do that. And I believe the first partnership was more family uh, oriented, but he ended up having seven different partnerships. Mm -hmm. uh, one was like 11 doctors put in $10,000 each. Another was uh, part of Homer Dodge, I think, from Vermont who okay. was a physics professor, drove all the way uh, from Vermont to Omaha. Wow, to, right from the East Coast, he drives all the way? Wow. All the way to Omaha, 1,500 miles. And he gave he gave Warren his uh, entire family uh, fortune of $150,000. And, and Homer's, by the time Homer died, this was, in, again, in 56, I think he did this, uh, by the time he died in 83, uh, they say that that was worth tens of millions of dollars. Oh, I can imagine. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, he did, he did this from 56 to 69, 13 years, his average rate of return was uh, 36% versus the, uh, I think the s and P, I want to say was nine percent. Wow, that's a huge uh, difference. Yeah, he and he made twenty five million dollars, and, and the rest of the partners made a hundred million. And one of the biggest deals that he made was when he he bought he used twenty percent of the partnership money uh, when he purchased American Express shares and American Express shares. Uh, there was a big scandal that that happened. This guy, uh, American Express, invested in this oil company, mm -hmm. and uh, I can't remember the name of it. Standard something mm -hmm. oil, yeah, uh, dressing company. And this guy was kind of a con who ended up going to prison because of this. He had the oil in these big tanks, and he put the oil in the top, but the rest of it was full of water. Oh. So he he fooled everybody for a while, but he eventually got caught. Uh, and American Express, you know, they they uh, got caught right in the middle of it because they invested with this company yeah. and yeah. their stock the credibility price went was down at stake. Yeah, yeah. Stock price went down fifty percent. Wow! What an opportunity for Warren. Warren saw what, what, this. Yeah, and he's Warren thinking to him. Yeah, you know, this is this is. Classic Warren Buffett, you know, yeah. the uh, value investing Warren Buffett thinking, uh, should I invest in this company? Is it as bad yeah. as they say it is? And so what he used was uh, um, the scuttlebutt methodology. And the uh -huh. scuttlebutt methodology is where you're going out into uh, the environment and you're you're observing what's happening out there. And he went to Garotz, <laughs> you know, back to Garotz, mm -hmm. and he stood right behind the cash register and he observed were people using their American Express cards. Oh, and that's then he very, went yeah. <laughs> streetwise. Yeah, right? absolutely street smart. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then he would go to the department stores and he would do the same thing. Yeah. And he noticed that everybody was still using their American Express cards. Yes. And that's when he he went in and he bought, you know, 20% of the partnership money. And he made a boatload of money. I can imagine. You know, yeah. Tens yeah. of millions of dollars yeah. off of that investment. Yeah. Yeah. That's oh, an wow. example of what he was doing during his, his partnership years. And he'll tell you that 
Uh, you know, it, it it's easy for him, at least. It's easy to make money when you don't have as much money. Mm, true, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. That's good. <laughs> You, you know, you have sat across Warren Buffet at, during your lunch sessions. Uh, how is he as a person to talk to? What have been your conversations? You know, have you been to his home Do, since you know his family? Uh, my, uh, my brother was friends with Howie, uh -huh. the oldest son, and he's played handball over at uh, Warren's house. Oh, he has he's, a handball court in his house? He has a handball court in the basement. Okay. Uh, of their house and uh i haven't been in the house no but my brother has and uh but what i usually did when we would go visit warren is just i i would always take my students over to his house okay and they'd get out of the car uh -huh. uh, and and they you know walk around he probably has a lot of people doing this uh -huh. you know wow. probably about i've been doing this you know was doing it for about 15 years Initially, he didn't have a gate mm -hmm. on his house. Mm -hmm. Then he had kind of a a, a little gate. Okay, uh, but you could still see everything, and then okay. and then it just got it, for us. It was worse. Yeah, he <laughs> did. Yeah, and it it was getting worse and worse because you know he he wanted to keep his privacy. Yeah, yeah, but. Uh, I was going there with my students quite a while ago, and we would stand there and i remember i'll never forget this so i had these uh three young ladies and they're standing there and they're looking in the uh the window of the kitchen and they're they they come running back and they're all giggling and laughing they go warren buffett just waved at us oh awesome <laughs> so uh moments of their life yeah yeah uh, yeah so i was just kind of fun yeah. But I definitely would take people, even, you know, my uh, uh, professor friends, uh, uh -huh. I'd take them over to his house. And actually, we went there one year. We went down to his office, okay, uh, the Kiewit building, and mm -hmm. we walked in there and we uh, were quickly uh, told to leave. Okay. What I believe is he still stays in the same house where which he bought years back or rather. Since 1957. Wow. And he's still in the same office building. Oh, since he started as well. Okay, you uh, and with fame, does he have security around him? What's life in and around Warren Buffet, or is he still the same guy the way you've seen him years back? I think uh, one of the things that he loves about Omaha is he doesn't need mm. that. Yeah, yeah, true. true. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that he has security at the shareholder meeting. Hmm. But that's different yeah yeah driving yeah. around omaha the people are the people in the midwest are very hard working down to earth humble people hmm. and, which is just like warren yeah he, yeah true he he liked it there he didn't want to live in new york city mm -hmm. his father told him not to live in new york city uh benjamin graham said don't live in new york city okay. Uh, and, you know, he went back to Omaha where his family was and mm. and uh, he 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 loves the University of Nebraska Cornhuskers. Mm. Uh, he graduated undergrad from there. You know, mm. he went to Penn for two years mm. and he dropped out of Penn and he transferred to Nebraska and got his undergraduate degree. And he had 50 people working for him okay. at the newspaper there while he was going to school full time. Wow. OK, that's good. That's good. In fact, uh, Benjamin Graham reminds me about he's he's one of his mentors, right? Uh, how important uh, yeah. was was uh, these mentors in his life? How much of their contribution in terms of shaping his life were they his mentors, or did he have mentors other than these two guys? Well, mentors, influencers. Um, I would say the most important one was his father mm -hmm. uh, and his wife Susie. Mm -hmm. Because uh, um, Warren, by far, is a genius, and he he was socially awkward. Yeah. And when he married his uh, wife Susie, she made up for that. She uh -huh. was his other half. Hmm. And uh, Susie Junior told me I interviewed her for the book, and she told me that every night at dinner, that they would have somebody uh, like a minority or somebody that was mm. economically 
disadvantaged sitting at, at the table with them. And so she was really into helping people and working wow. with the community and giving back to the community. Amazing. Uh, and and at, before she died, she was going to be the one that got all the money mm-hmm. that, that Warren was going to give to uh, uh, charity. Right. Mm, oh, and he's wow. still going to give 95.5% of his money to charity. And if, if he didn't already give all that money away, he'd probably be the richest man in the world oh, right now. Oh, of course, of course. That, that's that's very important uh, point that you mentioned. Uh, I know there is a succession planning within his company. So maybe you could share about it. And, and how is Warren Buffet, or for that matter, even Charlie Munger, doing at this age? Because I know apparently... Cognitive skills are good, but but is he that active uh, now? The last that you saw him, uh, Charlie, 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 and both uh, Warren, yeah, yeah. Uh, something that I noticed at the last shareholder meeting that I've never seen before was they have these. Uh, um, I don't know what they're called, but they're like little podiums and, mm-hmm. and there's words that come across them. Okay. And, and in front of them. And I've ah, never uh, seen Okay. That the before. teleprompters, probably a reference. Teleprompter. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. yeah, I've never seen that before. That was new. Mm. You know, not that it's that big of a deal, you know, mm-hmm. but yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, that, that's you know, really even even today's age, anybody, everybody uses these teleprompters. Yeah, but yeah. he, they're not going to retire. The, yeah, I mean the, they're they're going to die doing what they love. They're never yeah. going to retire. True, true, true. I can imagine. What but they have it all lined yeah. up. They, yeah. I, I got interviewed at this year's meeting, uh, with uh, three other guys by a guy from uh, Gabelli Gabelli mm-hmm. Fund. Uh, Mac, Mac Sykes, mm-hmm. and uh, we were talking about you know what happens, yeah, after Buffett dies, yeah, you know? and, and uh, the the conclusion was by some you know really smart people they say oh you you know maybe you take a five percent, ten percent hit on on the stock but it'll come back mm. uh, because they've got it set up, and this is quote unquote from Warren and, and Charlie any any idiot could run this. We set it up so any idiot could run this company. Mm-hmm. You know, they've got all these great companies that they own that are uh, creating a, a constant cash flow yeah. for the yeah. company. True. So it may not be a bad idea to buy when they die. Mm-hmm. When it cr- crashes 5-10%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the very edifice... And and now that you, you you know we all know Warren Buffet and his company integrity trust are very crucial factors. The basic framework, the basic edifice is very strong, right? So these companies are are all all there to go for years and years, right? Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, you you mentioned about the secret sauce. What's the secret sauce? No, I don't, I'm not convinced that anybody knows what the secret sauce is. Because you know, valuing a company is part art and part science. Yeah. You know, I, I I worked on that for a long time. Yeah. To try and figure that out. And I looked and you know, came up with uh, qualitative and quantitative things, and then the yeah. DCF. All that stuff is in the book. Yeah. Uh, on all the things that he looks at. And and I thought I did a really good job yeah. on that. Absolutely. And, but it took me a long time to do. Oh, of course. And, Almost 14 years, right? Not easy. <laughs> oh, no. no. Uh, but, you know, the thing is, is that what I really like what I did was, is, is I tried to fit a, fill a niche that wasn't out there already. So what I noticed was when I was reading all these Buffett books, nobody gave me an ex- example hmm. of how to value, hmm. say, Apple. Hmm. Uh, what do I do? What does Buffett look for metric wise? Yeah, you know the return on equity. How much does he want to see? You know, how do I get the return on equity? How do I calculate it? What does it mean? All that stuff. So I go through, I don't know, about seven or eight different metrics, yeah. and I, I calculate everything out, and I look at ten years of metrics, and then I uh, talked about the DCF and how to do the DCF, and how you know the the what 
uh, numbers to put in the different areas uh, of the, because that can get kind of complicated for somebody who's got a degree in biology hmm. Hmm. or a degree yeah. in psychology. You know, yeah. they won't have a clue on how to do any of this. Oh, stuff. definitely. Yeah. Yet, yeah. yet they want to learn about investing. Mm. And what does it mean? Yeah. Yeah. Agree. Agree. Yeah. Todd, uh, uh, I also wanted to know, uh, let, let's talk about you, right? The the author, the professor, the under, uh, you know, the academia, uh, your experience. Uh, you have had a very good association with Warren Buffet. Has it changed you in, in some ways? The way he thinks, the way he acts, the way you've interacted with him. Has it also brought some kind of a change in your personality? What have you learned? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I think there's not a day that goes by, Santosh, that I don't, by by writing this book, that it hasn't had a, a positive impact on me in some way related to the way I act or the decisions that I make. Yeah. Uh, because of all the things that I've learned uh, and, and Buffett's, you know, he's he's a mentor of mine. Maybe, you know, maybe I don't talk to him every day, but I can go back and I can look at these things in the book and go, oh man, you know, that that's a pretty smart thing to do, you know? And uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples of things that really kind of stand out for me. Something stood out for me today. I can't remember what it was, but uh, it was related to to Warren and you know just thinking about some of the decisions that you make you you think uh you take extra time to think oh you know what would Warren do in this situation mm. you know, am i doing the right thing here uh one of my favorite is something that what Benjamin Franklin said and you know Charlie loves Benjamin Franklin, and uh, and he said something to the effect of, "I will speak no evil of any man, but only good things mm. of men." And you know, when you're standing around people and somebody's there and they're talking negatively yeah. about somebody else, I'm just now I think, okay, you know what's this guy going to be saying about me when I walk away? You know, do you want to yeah. be around people like that? Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And do I want to be the one talking like that? Hmm. No, no way. I, and, and one of the reasons why I bring that up is, is that I have never heard Warren say anything negative hmm. about anybody at any event. The only negative thing that happened uh, that I can think of with him was his, uh, uh, and I was reading about this today, was his son Pete mm. married a woman that already had two kids, and then they got divorced. Mm -hmm. And one of the kids went on a show and was saying negative things about Warren. Oh. Uh, and so he's had problems with her, and but he he's worked them out. Mm -hmm. supposedly but by now but mm -hmm. that's the only negative thing that i've heard ever yeah 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 ever yeah. say and he you know every time even at the shareholder meetings he's always got a smile on his face he's always positive he's always upbeat he's the most opera he he really is the most positive guy i think i know you know and i think yeah. oh the stock market's gonna go down all this yeah. other and there's stuff. always Everybody that element of that. humor right that he brings out the element he's of got humor. a great yeah. sense of humor yeah, yeah you know and and uh um for every he says this for every hundred years uh there's going to be 15 bad years in the stock market mm -hmm. yeah just yeah. you know accept it yeah true and he also says if you're not willing to take a loss of 50 percent, him and mm -hmm. charlie say this yeah you shouldn't be in the market yeah 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 and over the past 50 years, I think that their stock has gone down 50% three times. True, yeah. But it's survived, yeah. True. But uh, I'd say one of the biggest uh, things that I learned in the book 
uh, was how to be a better person. When my students came back and I talked to them, uh, what what was the biggest thing that you learned from the experience? They they would always say how to be a better person. You know how to live your life hmm. better. It wasn't oh uh, I learned how to to value a stock. <laughs> it was yeah yeah. It was always the personal know, how, the personal how to be a better thing. person. You know, yeah. and he, the humility, the, the humbleness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the first things he says is is uh, you know the about marriage, which I've never heard anybody say before, is uh, the most important decision that you'll make in your life is who you marry. Hmm. Important, yeah. Maybe. But I've got on chapter two, I've got a whole section in there on Dale Carnegie. And I've got several quotes that are that are excellent. I've the got quotes right? throughout the book. Yeah, yeah. Throughout yeah. the book about how to live a better life and the things that you do. And uh, I I have a presentation that that I, I share with uh, places that I go, and I have like three slides uh -huh. on how to be a better person and things that you should be thinking about. And uh, you know, Warren says if you think that two X is gonna make you happier than x you may be thinking wrong or you know if you want 10x instead of x uh yeah. you may be doing things that aren't uh necessarily uh, ethical yeah yeah and okay. that he wouldn't do business with somebody that made his stomach churn True. even if he could make a hundred million dollars mm -hmm. there's just a couple of them right offhand yeah so so you know our uh your our target uh, most of our audience, uh, our, our viewers, are based in India, based out of India. Ha have you ever been to India, or are you plans planning to come to India, visit India? I have not been to India, but I want to go. Oh yeah, that that uh, that will be amazing. Uh, and and uh, as you know, right, uh, India, as they call the Amrit Kal, the next twenty five plus years are going to be super super uh active for India. There's a lot of focus on India. What's 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 your take on India? I, I'm very keen. Uh, keen to know your views. What, how do you view India in the coming in these recent years? Well, I think India has a great opportunity. And I think you guys are already taking advantage of that opportunity, but you know it, it's going to be enormous. Hmm. You know, I know a couple of guys. Uh, I think his name is uh, Guadam Bain, mm -hmm. who's written a book uh, on on investments, and he focuses only on India. Uh huh. And he's uh, um, Monish Pabrai again uh, is yep, another yep, yep, uh, yep. guy that I've listened to. I haven't met him yet. But eventually, I'll probably meet him. Um, but there, there's just a lot of opportunity. I wish I knew more about the companies in India. You know, if I was going to study any comp any country, it would be India right now. Awesome. That's how much I think. I, I uh, haven't shared a lot of stuff, uh, uh, you know, about the culture, about the companies. Maybe it could help you in your research piece. And you must definitely be on the ground in India, you know, to know more about, uh, you know. And I'll also try and get you in touch with people who probably could give you give their own views, you know, their their part of the story about the India story, as we call it. You know, yeah. I I'd love to. Uh, my wife isn't always as keen on traveling as I am. Then but I love the, to travel and meet people. Then, then, then it's the right time to be in India and, you know, looking at India from a different uh, perspective. And as you know, there are so many Indians who are big fans of uh, Warren Buffet. So you'll be very much in demand, uh, you know, with your lecture series uh, if you visit India. So, yeah. What are your key takeaways to wrap up? What are your key takeaways from Warren Buffet? Uh, and and, and you're also as your life as an entrepreneur. The reason I ask this is because there's this huge startup revolution in India as we speak, right? There's a tremendous uh, emphasis uh, on being an entrepreneur. Startup culture is really taking shape. It has, in fact, taken shape. And, of course, also, also uh, India has a strong demographic dividend, as we call it. An average age of 25 is in majority in India today. So there's a huge potential for India. So what could be your message for them? What are your key takeaways that you would like to share with uh, our, our audiences in India watching you? Um, if you want to be an entrepreneur, which I think India is very entrepreneurial, yeah, uh, I would uh, 
the most successful entrepreneurs have both education and experience. Now you don't need necessarily a degree, yeah. but uh, from my own experiences of, of being an entrepreneur times five and a nonprofit entrepreneur, uh, there are things that you just need to know. Yeah. You know, you need to, to know accounting and, you know, how to, to write off expenses and how to market your product. And you just, you need to know that stuff. So you either get somebody on your team that knows how to do that, or you take a class or you listen to a podcast or you, you just got to learn. You got to constantly learn. Being an entrepreneur is just not easy. It's mm -hmm. difficult to be a yeah. successful entrepreneur. Yeah. You've got to be on it. True. You've got to be hungry. Yeah. That's how I opened my book. Yeah. I opened my book and the, the first chapter and the first paragraph is I open my book and I say, I come to class on the first day and I draw uh, a refrigerator on, on the chalkboard, on the whiteboard. And I ask my students, what is this? None of them know. I say, okay, it's a refrigerator. Then I open it up. I go, okay, what's in the refrigerator? And nobody gets it. And I say, nothing. And then I go, this is what entrepreneurs are. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurs are hungry. And I can't teach you that. Mm -hmm. You're either hungry or you're not. Yeah. And that's when I, I look at everybody's face and the entrepreneurs are, are smiling. And of course, the people that aren't entrepreneurs are just going, <laughs> you know, what Can am I imagine. doing in there? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. But, but there's so much of focus on entrepreneurship. Yeah, I agree. So uh, I've taught entrepreneurship for a long time. And, you know, by the end of the first class, I'll know who's an entrepreneur in the class and who's not. Mm, interesting. Yeah. 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 But, uh, you know, being an entrepreneur is great. You know, uh, the men, the primary motivator for men is freedom and independence. Mm. It's not money. Yeah. Money is number two. Yeah. For women, it's more um, self-satisfaction. Yeah. Because the corporate America really has a roof on the ceiling as far as where they can go. Mm. Uh, and money is number four for women, mm. for their motivation. Mm. Um, I, I think being an entrepreneur is great if you can find your niche, if you Find an area that you're really passionate about that you know something about. Go work for a company for six months to a year uh, and, and find the niches and then go off and do something on your own or yeah. work longer and save money uh, so you'll have money when you go off and do your own thing. Yeah, That's mm -hmm. usually what I tell my students is go work for somebody for six months to a year and learn the industry. Yeah. And ask questions, lots of questions. Lots of questions, yeah, yeah. You got to be curious. You got to be, you know, asking a lot more questions, yeah. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Todd Pinkel, uh, amazing catching up with you. Awesome. Uh, you know, an investor, an entrepreneur, uh, and of course, a professor, and most importantly, an author. So much... Uh, content you had to share with us, so much of uh, information, so much of your values that you've shared with us. Uh, it's, it's been an amazing uh, conversation with you. Uh, and I'm very, very sure uh, that, you know, our listeners, our viewers in India would definitely pick up a copy of your book, uh, Warren uh, Buffet, Investor and Entrepreneur. Well, uh, here's the clip of it, of the book that I show on the screen as we speak. Make sure you have a grab a copy. And of course, uh, in November 2023, expect an audio version in Marathi, but that's for the guys in Maharashtra. And of course, we hope to have an Indian Hindi version as well uh, of, of this as an audio book. Uh, any parting last thoughts, uh, uh, Todd, from your side? You should go to the shareholder meeting this year, Santosh. You'll, you'll uh, have a great time. Yeah, sure. You'll sure. love it. Sure. It, it'll be memorable. You know, these guys are not getting any younger. Yeah. <laughs> indeed, indeed. 
Thank you once again, Todd, for joining on, on this edition of The Sound of Money. It's been truly an honor to have you, uh, for me to host you on this, on this podcast. Thanks for having me, Santosh. And more importantly, I, I, you know, you accepted my invite in less than one hour. That's very important. I believe I'm the first podcaster actually reaching out to you from India. Yeah, you are. Uh, but yeah, great to have you. Thank you so much. And let's great. be in touch. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Santosh. with Santosh Serut.